if I'm looking at my newsfeed, how come the outcome of a vote or a referendum is so different to what I'm expecting it to be? All right, so it's because all the people that post their opinions of what's going to happen uh, are people that you've made friends with, uh, and they're producing a kind of filter bubble which is showing you all the same information that you think, just shared by other people who think the same thing of you. And it's a phenomenon of uh, who you've made friends with and thus what information that filters towards you through Facebook. This is an interesting social media phenomenon that we, we've seen research about for a while now and that people are investigating for how to deal with because what you've experienced there is called a social media filter bubble. Uh, and it's the way that technology is affecting the information we see on a day-to-day -day basis and who we see it from and who we talk to. Uh, and it's based on several theories of how we develop friendships and things like that. Um, but it's really a kind of uh, increasingly well-established phenomenon that we essentially um, make friends with people that we know and like are similar to us. And then uh, all the information we see on a daily basis is coming from those people who have the same opinions as we do. So it's exactly one of the two interesting things that we've been seeing lately on referendums and voting is that uh, our Facebook feed feels very, very different to the national outcome. So without discussing you know, sides and outcomes and votes. It's just interesting to see that uh, the votes have come out differently to what a lot of people expect, or it's just been a lot closer than we expect. Uh, so either side of how you see what happened, um, it was really close and you don't see the same balance likely in your Facebook feed. Let's talk about who we make friends with, because this is an interesting set of theories as to what, what affects who we choose to talk to and what's like. There's several things like attractiveness or uh, reciprocity of uh, sharing information with each other or, or just uh, helping each other with things. These are all fine, but two key ones are location, so who we're likely to run into, uh, and also similarity. Now the similarity one is different, is interesting uh, in what effect it has. There was a nice quote that I found. Um, so similarity includes having similar attitudes, values, interests and beliefs, while also being of similar age, gender, socio-economic status, education and attractiveness has come up again. Uh, so we're good friends because we're both very attractive. Um, but that similarity statement is quite interesting. So social economic status, uh, interests, values, these are all the things that affect, you know, maybe who we would vote for or, which, or what things we vote for. Um, but it means that if we're friends with lots of people who are similar to us, then we see those same values coming out now over and over again. Um, and so this is what's affecting the, the social media filter bubble. Is it, are we getting what we want? Is that what it is? <laughs> Well, part of it is self-satisfaction and getting what we want from our friends and social networks. Um, but to understand how we can design technology to uh, affect this or change this or to give us a more balanced view of what's happening in the world, there's several things we might want to look at, several theories that will help us look at it. Um, one of them is just the theories of communication and the kind of major types of communication we have with people. There's interpersonal communication, uh, which is two or more people talking to each other in a kind of continuous varying dialogue, which is fine. And then the other is mass broadcast, um, which is a kind of the opposite perspective where one person is talking and everyone else is sort of receiving. Um, and so when a politician goes on TV and says something, this is broadcast. And when we talk to each other in our homes, this is uh, interpersonal communication. And one of the challenges of what's happening on social media is that we're sort of trying to be, be interpersonal, but we are doing broadcast. So let's bear that in mind as one thing. The second is uh, based on common ground theory. So whenever we talk to someone, we have this kind of concept of what the other person knows and if we say something, how they'll receive it. So uh, when I talk to some people about technology, I take it at quite a high level because I expect them not to understand the detail, but to be interested in the reasons and the concepts behind it. But then when you talk to another nerd, you start talking about low level things that only you two would find interesting. But it means that when we say something uh, in a group with friends, we would first maybe uh, say something to kind of estimate how they might respond to an issue. Uh, so if you say something bold about your opinion of politics, then uh, will they think the same thing as you? And then once you have a good estimate of that, you would then choose what you say. Uh, so we always have this kind of continuous gradient of estimating how much to say about what we think and uh, whether you can make a casual joke about it and they'll take that or not. This is fine if we're in an interpersonal real life setting, but challenging when we are online on Facebook or something like that, and we're not quite sure who's going to see it. So then there's the size of our friendship networks is the interesting thing. Um, 
there's something called the Dunbar number, which is a social science uh, well-known number, or social psychology well-known number, um, which estimates that we can manage about 150 friendships at most. Some, they say between 100 and 250, but people tend to zero in on kind of 150. Uh, and this isn't strong, strong relationships, but relationships with people that we can sort of chat to and catch up and then carry on with normal. Uh, and then as we get more and more people, people start sliding off that 150 and going elsewhere. But what we have on Facebook is a lot more people. Now Dunbar has done some more research more recently saying that it doesn't help us manage more real life connections, but he acknowledges that we have mostly a lot more people listening to us. You might have 300 friends on Facebook, uh, you might have 500, you know, celebrities have thousands, whatever. Um, but it just means that whatever we say, uh, we are not only saying to more people than we can normally have a normal friendship with, we're saying it to a broader audience, which encourages this mass communication. There's also an interesting Facebook study done by Bernstein et al. in 2013 where they uh, analysed how many people you think see your Facebook posts. This is a Facebook study. And they found that we estimate about 27% of the actual number of people who see it. So if we think 27 people saw it, 100 people saw it. So we have this huge underestimation of who will see whatever we say online as well as who the audience is and trying to estimate it. So what does this mean for us? This means that when we're on Facebook and we're talking about uh, politics, we are trying to say interpersonal things with somebody who we think shares our same opinion, but we're broadcasting it to a much bigger audience than we're, normal, than we're used to. And we're in this very binary status of share, not share, and we don't have this kind of gradient of share certain things, certain people. The other effect this has had then on things like the referendum or elections is that it's created a lot more difference between people or it's divided people more because we've said things in a very broadcast politician type way that we might only say normally to someone who's a friend at home um, or we would choose how to say it differently to a friend, to another friend. Um, so the impact this then has on our filter bubbles is that it exaggerates our filter bubbles. We might unfollow someone on Facebook, not necessarily defriend them, but just turn off their posts so that we don't see uh, something we disagree with or something we don't find interesting. Uh, and so we specialize our filter bubble to even more what we want to see and who we want to hear it from. Uh, and it creates the divide even more as to what's happening. And we have a less realistic view of the whole world. Then, so what we have to do with technology is figure out how to, how and when we should affect that, which means there's a lot of research at the moment looking at how do you manipulate filter bubbles? How often should you bring in different types of content? It's the kind of thing that set off the Facebook emotion study that got lots of negative press. And they were trying to say, if we slightly manipulate the Facebook feed to have different types of content, positive and negative, or different political views, then what effects does this have on people? Um, so there's a lot of research going into how can we build an algorithm which samples different people's points of view, but while still being something you find comfortable and interesting. Um, because, of course, we get a lot of social, personal value from Facebook that makes us happy. It's a lot more to do with well-being than it is to do about political communications. Does that mean that maybe someone thinks they're being an activist, but the computer science side of things is, is causing that perhaps just not to go to who they're hoping it will go to? Yeah, so the, the algorithm is optimised to show you things that you're likely to like, and it's uh, optimised to kind of later on show you things. If you continue to look and you want to see more and more, to then bring in other stuff that you might not normally press the like button on. So that sort of means that if we say something, then the majority of people in your Facebook filter bubble who are already on your side anyway, probably just see a small statement and maybe like it. And then the people who wouldn't have liked it probably wouldn't see it. So it's, it all exaggerates the filter bubble. And so the question is, can we design algorithms which are more varied or sample variation at the right rates? Uh, or bring in different types of opinions at the right sort of times, give you balanced views, or know when to give you balanced views. It's a huge opportunity because we're in this massive social technology space where it's mediating the, the vast majority of our communication, but yet it's optimised one way, not kind of in a balanced way. The problem is that if I obtain a cookie off you, which is supposed to be secure, then I can send that to, let's say, Amazon or to a shop and say, I'm Sean, please, you know, what's in his shopping basket? What's his address? What's his credit card details?